Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday, end of June. Summer is uh, really letting us know it's here, isn't it? <laughs> All right, um, so this is our monthly coffee with. I'm Cynthia Pohl. I'm the chief financial officer here at John Knox, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do behind the scenes today in our accounting department. So our agenda today is who are the accounting team, where you can find us, when you can see us, and what we do. And then at the end, I'm going to throw in a topic that we like to kind of just keep refreshing everybody about with some safeguards for identity theft and fraud. So who are the accounting team? This is our accounting team. Isn't it amazing what AI can do? artificial intelligence. I typed in, show me a picture of a four-person accounting team with three females and one male. And this is what it gave it. But this looks nothing like us. So I thought I would introduce the real team. So I got my team here this morning, so come on up, team. We're a small department, so we can get away with doing this at the coffee with. <laughs> All right, so we have a small department. We're a four-person team. Oops. Um, how do I get my little mouse over there to work? Not that I don't know who you guys are. All right, so Don Jones in the middle here. Um, Don has been at John Knox for about 14 years total. Um, she's been in various different departments, and she has been in the accounting department what, right around three, a little over three, three years. And she does um, our accounts receivable, which basically means she does the resident billing and anything and everything associated with that. We have David Centeno. He is our senior accounts payable and payroll specialist. And he has been here at John Knox for about three and a half years. Pretty close. And then we have Nicole Schmider. She is our controller, and um, so she, ha she splits up a lot of things with me in the more accounting side with uh, monthly close and a lot of our regulatory reporting we do and things like that. Um, and uh, she has been here at John Knox not quite three years, but pretty close. So that's the team. Let's give them a hand. They're an awesome bunch. They do a great job. All right, you're good to go. <laughs> All right, next couple things, easy stuff. Where can you find us? If you've never been to our office, um, sometimes it's a little bit of a, uh, a, a, a treasure hunt, let's call it, to find our office. Um, we are in actually Oak View Suites. So we are located on the first floor in the 100 wing of Oak View Suites. Um, so that's where you can find our office. And when can you see us? Well, we pretty much have an open door policy Monday through Friday. Um, we would prefer between nine and four that lets us get our morning started and lets us get our day wrapped up at the end. No appointments are necessary. So we've got a, our door does stay locked because we're in a residential area, we have a lot of confidential information, but we have a doorbell now on our, uh, right outside our door, so just come on over and ring the doorbell. And um, really, the only time that we're closed up is we do close for the six major holidays that we tend to recognize, and then we do close up occasionally for you know some staff meetings and functions. Um, we'll put a sign on the door saying, we're closed right now, please come back. So they had a sign on the door saying, we're closed right now, please come back, while they were over here with us this morning. So what do we do? So I'm going to use the analogy of an iceberg, right? We all know uh, what it means about an iceberg and the warnings about an iceberg and the facts about an iceberg, that what you see above the surface is only a little bit, and what is below the surface is where everything is at. That's where the bulk of the iceberg is. That's where the bulk of our work is. So kind of what you see on the surface 
compared to really everything that we're doing and behind the scenes is kind of like that iceberg analogy. So I'm just going to touch on kind of some highlights today of what goes on in our office, what we do, because otherwise I would have you here all day long trying to really talk about the full scope. All right, so what we do, accounts receivable. So this was Dawn that you met. Um, so accounts receivable encompasses really a lot of different functions all month long. Um, you know, I can say that, jo that Dawn's job takes a day or it takes a week or it takes the whole month, depending on your perspective, what the different tasks are that she's doing and that type of thing. But just kind of some of the highlights that she works on with accounts receivable. So she does the monthly resident statements for independent living and assisted living. So when she's doing the statements, by time she's done, she has sent out approximately 680 statements plus the backup that goes in with them. So backup that we put in with the statements includes if, you, if a resident had pharmacy charges, we put their pharmacy bill. If they had home health services, we put a copy of their home health bill and things like that. So um, when she gets ready to print her statements and put everything together, so everybody's pretty familiar with what a ream of copy paper looks like. It's about that thick, and I think it's a 500 pages, right, 500 pages. So she uses almost two reams of copy paper by the time she does the statements and all the backup. So that's a lot of paper that's, you know, getting collated together to put out. The monthly service fee billing, just for some interesting statistics, is about $1.9 million monthly for the independent living and the assisted living. I'm also throwing on there for the Majestic Oaks that monthly, of course, theirs is much more census driven, right? They, their census can change uh, quicker than it does in independent living and assisted living because they are doing short term re rehab over there that you know, has people coming in and out. Um, but on average, their monthly total billing and service fees is about $1.1 million. Now, side note, in our accounting office, we do not do the billing for Majestic Oaks. Um, Jermaine Wood is the business office coordinator over at Majestic Oaks, and she does the billing for Majestic Oaks for all the private pay and then we outsource all of the billing to Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance services to um, a, contracted, a contracted third party service. All right, accounts payable. So that was David. This is one of David's functions. And so for um, accounts payable, that is paying our bills. That's what accounts payable be. Um, so all of our services, our vendors, your entertainers that are here, um, all the food that you enjoy, um, all the supplies that go with it, all the supplies we need to do our housekeeping and our maintenance and everything, right? Those are all going to be invoices that are coming in to um, the campus to need to be paid to the vendors. So we do our accounts payable weekly. So every week we are running payments and we run through every week everything that we have. So um, we do not key everything into the system and then go through and pick and choose what we're going to pay for the week and what we're not going to pay. If we have the invoice, we get it paid. In a year, well, so half a year, because year to date 2024 through June, we have processed approximately 6,000 plus invoices. So that's our directors are involved in that process because they're getting the invoices, they're approving them, they're signing off on them, they're forwarding them over to the accounting department. David organizes those invoices. He has to get them in, keyed into the system. If it's a new vendor, we have to get the new vendor set up. Um, you know, we're checking to make sure that maybe it's not a duplicate invoice that's already been paid. So there's a lot of steps that go into processing those invoices. And so far, year to date, in 2024, we have issued $15 million plus dollars in vendor payments. So again, that's anything and everything you can think of, but that does not include payroll. 
because our staff are not vendors and we pay our vendors via either an actual check or we can do an a c h direct debit from our account into their account which we control that process the vendors do not have access to our accounts to pull the money we push the money so it's the vendors choice on how they want to be paid either check or a c h and we do not do any cash payments to vendors ever the next thing on our list is our payroll so this is the other main function that David does so he has accounts payable and payroll as his two main functions um, and again you know payroll is um, you know a lot of steps in that process before the accounting department starts working on our piece of the payroll there's a lot that every department director and their managers and staff have to do to make that payroll happen um, but so by time it comes to us we're processing payroll payroll is bi-weekly so we pay our employees every other week our pay periods run from sat Sunday to Saturday Sunday to Saturday for two weeks at a time on the Monday that ends the pay period all the departments are busy reviewing those time cards signing off on those time cards fixing anything like um, if there's a missing time clock punch if there's PTO that needs to go in anything like that and they have Monday morning to get that done so that Monday afternoon we can do all the magic behind that of actually getting the payroll processed um, Tuesday morning it needs to be ready to go to Mr. Trainer as a final review and once he signs off on it then we push the button to submit it to our third party um, vendor that actually does the actual processing of the payroll we do not issue the checks in-house we do not do the direct deposits in-house we use um, a vendor called paychecks which is one of the many payroll companies out there and that's who actually does the final processing of the payroll so each payroll we have about 600 employees now that have to you know have their time cards approved and submitted and be processed um, in addition with you know other things that are uh, going in with that payroll and right now our payroll every two weeks is running at a gross total of about eight hundred twenty five thousand dollars so that's gross payroll plus the employers matching taxes for Medicare and Social Security and if you're doing the math in your head that's a little over twenty one point five million dollars in a year for payroll so guess what our biggest expense is right all right um, another function that we do in the business office is we assist the foundation with some of their bookkeeping services um, currently we do some tasks for them of we um, record their deposits after they've made their deposits for you know from the gift shop and um, from donations that they get and things like that we record their deposits into the software system um, they give us invoices that they have gotten in for various things that they have approved and so we get those invoices into the system and cut the checks for those issue the checks for those and then at the end of the month we're helping to um, do any journal entries and reconcile their bank accounts um, we're changing up our uh, services that we're going to be doing with the foundation um, we're kind of finalizing that we're going to be enhancing that a little bit more we're going to get a little more involved in assisting with their audit process because they do an audit every year just like John Knox uh, community does an audit every year and they also do a 990 business return every year so we're going to get more involved um, with that process to help assist with those and now we kind of start getting into a list that moves more into kind of true accounting type work um, and these are things that come much more into play that Nicole and I are kind of split between us we both work on there's some things she works on specifically some that I work on specifically we cross you know with each other with some of the things um, so some of the other things that we're doing in there is financial planning and analysis for the community so that includes our budgeting process um, it includes financial forecasting 
So as we go along during the year, we're constantly looking at, okay, how are we looking compared to budget, where we thought we would be, um, how's it going to look by the time we get to the end of the year based on how it is right now or something that we know that's you know coming up down the road. So we're, we're looking at that financial forecasting. And then, of course, we're always doing data analytics. A lot of that data analytics has to do with, uh, we do a lot of analytics with our um, our overall census. Um, we do a lot of analytics with our reimbursement rates. You know, what is what is the average that we're getting both from private with our monthly service fees, from our insurance companies uh, with Majestic Oaks, um, doing data analytics with our staffing. Um, general ledger work. Uh, so that is essentially the financials and keeping the books. Um, so we close books every month, we close books at the end of the year, um, and with closing of those books, we produce financial statements, so we have monthly financial statements that are issued internally to the team and to the board of directors every month, along with the yearly financial statements, and then we're doing labor reports, so every payroll that processes every two weeks, then we have a very specific labor report that we're putting together that kind of encompasses some of that data analysis that we're pushing back out to the directors that kind of gives them a summary of view of here's what your staffing, hours, labor cost is looking like for the specific payrolls that just got done, but we also track that year to date. Compliance reporting. So compliance reporting is not just for healthcare, right? We all know that Majestic Oaks and assisted living, because they are considered healthcare, they have a lot of compliance regulatory items with Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, um, ACA, the American Healthcare Association, but there's a lot of compliance reporting that happens down in our accounting office as well. And one of our biggest ones is to the Florida OIR, the Office of Insurance Regulation. Uh, so the Florida OIR is the governing state agency for CCRCs. That's the Chapter 651 that you've heard in conversations um, many times around the campus, I'm sure. Um, so we do a lot of reporting back to them. We have an annual report that goes to them. And that annual report is due 120 days after the end of our fiscal year. We're on a calendar fiscal year. So for us, that means that annual report is due May 1st. We have a minimum liquid reserve that we are required to calculate annually. And we do that around the same time that we do the annual report. And we have to then submit that report and calculation to the Florida OIR. The minimum liquid reserve changes once a year, so we calculate it once a year, and then those are the funds that they require to keep that we're, they require us to keep in an escrow bank account, and we're not allowed to touch that money. Um, so that money just sits there. It's kind of a, um, I mean, it's not a nice way to say it, but it's kind of a doomsday money, doomsday account, right? And um, so that is required to stay in an escrow account. And through the rest of this week, that requirement has been $9.4 million that we're required to keep in an account that we can't touch. <laughs> On July 1st, that requirement is gonna change to $9.9 .9 million that we are required to keep there. So that calculation is based on looking at essentially the cost of operations um, and it's it's literally a 45 page document that <laughs> leads us to that calculation to get to that number um, so effective on July 1 that requirement changes to 9.9 .9 million dollars that we are required to keep in that escrow account and not touch and we can't use it <laughs> currently we actually have $10.8 million in that reserve account. We keep a cushion of money in that account because it is affected by the markets and it will fluctuate monthly with unrealized gains and unrealized losses. So 
because the OIR cares about the market rate of the account. They don't care how much you put into it initially. They care about what is the market rate of it in case you had to go pull all that money out today, how much would you be able to have access to? So we want to make sure that we keep enough of a cushion in there that any fluctuations in the market keep us above that required amount. We also do quarterly reporting to the, uh, to the Florida OIR. It's very similar to the annual report. Um, it's just about a third of the size and a third of the information. So interestingly, everything that's in the quarterly report is also in the annual report, but not everything in the annual report is required in the quarterly report. Um, the quarterly reports, we only actually have to do three of them a year. We are not required to do a fourth quarter report because by the time you're doing fourth quarter, those reports are a cumulative year-to-date reporting. So we would essentially be duplicating efforts of doing a fourth quarter report and then turning around and also doing an annual report. So about four or five years ago, the OIR uh, did away with the fourth quarter reporting for communities that are in good standing. So we're in good standing with the OIR, we do not have to do quarter, uh, the fourth quarter reporting. And then we always have to report to them any um, changes to our board of directors, any new members that are coming on. So we've had a couple of new board of directors member join us um, for the month of June. So we've already reported that to the OIR. Um, if we have anybody that goes off the board for whatever reason, we also have to report that to the board or to the OIR. All right, CMS, uh, which I forgot to change on this slide. I'm very bad about using acronyms that I'm so used to, so um, I, I try to go back and catch. CMS stands for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, so we have a lot of compliance reporting that from the accounting office we do with them as well. We do annual cost reports, and cost reports are required for um, any provider that gets reimbursement from Medicare or Medicaid. So that includes Majestic Oaks, our skilled nursing facility has both Medicaid and Medicare. So that's a cost report for each of them. And then our home health is a Medicare provider. So home health also has to do a cost report. The cost report is, again, another, right by time we're done, it's like a 70 page report. Um, but it is, it's essentially taking what our expenses were for our fiscal operating year that relates specifically to either Majestic Oaks or to Home Health, and we put those in a report and we submit them to CMS. CMS uses those reports as one of their tools, but not their only tool, but as one of their tools to then determine what their reimbursement rate to us will be. So they're going to look and see what our costs are. They've got other things that they bring in to calculating that factor, but then that will then be a, a tool that they use for rate setting for what they will reimburse us when we are taking care of anybody under the Medicare or the Medicaid services. We also have a process called payroll-based journal that is a reporting to the CMS, and it is required to be done at a minimum quarterly. Um, which we have, that's been our main process is to do it quarterly. This year we actually uh, changed it up to where we are reporting it monthly. And what the payroll-based journal is, is reporting the staffing hours specifically for Majestic Oaks only to CMS. Why do we do that? Required minimum staffing, right? So we are regulated by ACA and CMS to have to meet certain required minimum, minimum staffing levels over at Majestic Oaks. The way they do that is with this process called payroll-based journal where we're essentially um, data mining from the time cards of all the staff and we have to organize that all together essentially to say here's all the hours for our CNAs, here's all the hours for the LPNs, here's all the hours for the nurses, Interestingly, it's not just the clinical staff that we have to report, 
we have to report every position that works over there so we're even reporting here's all the hours for housekeeping here's all the hours for dietary here's all the hours for therapy they're going to look at those hours they're going to compare it to what our census is over there every day and they will make sure that we are in compliance with meeting those minimum um, labor staffing so we do that in our office because it's pulling information from payroll and we do the payroll in our office so it just kind of goes hand in hand that the accounting has that as one of their functions Still continuing in our compliance reporting. More for the CMS. Um, we have something called a credit balance report that has to be reported to them monthly. And essentially that is a report just reflecting back to them if we have received any overpayments by Medicare. It's Medicare specific. Um, and that would result in a credit on somebody's account. So, you know, if Cynthia was over at MO and we billed for, um, we billed for $5,000 and for some reason Medicare paid us at $6,000, then there would be a $1,000 credit on Cynthia's account that's actually owed back to Medicare um, because that would have been them overpaying us. It's not owed to the resident, right, because the resident didn't pay that. So we have to send that report in monthly to them. Um, we do that for skilled nursing and for home health because, again, it's for any Medicare services and Medicare payments that we receive. And then we also have to, um, uh, the accounting office takes responsibility for keeping up with our provider certifications. Um, most of those are done on a biannual basis, but essentially it's just recertifying and renewing our contract uh, with Medicare and with Medicaid to continue to be a provider for those services. And because it's Medicare and Medicaid, any of our uh, services that we provide here, we would have to do those certifications for. So it in, uh, includes skilled nursing and Majestic Oaks, of course, and includes home health. We also have to do it for the physician's practice, right? Because we bill Medicare when you go to see Martha if you have Medicare, and we also have to do it for the pharmacy because the pharmacy also is a Medicare provider and can bill Medicare for your pharmacy needs. All right, some of the other compliance reporting. See, I told you there's a lot of compliance reporting in accounting. Um, so to the IRS, uh, we have our 990 return that is done annually. Right? We are a nonprofit organization that we all know, so we do not have income tax. So we don't have a tax return, but we instead have the 990 return, which is the return the IRS uses for nonprofit organizations. Um, and part of this return is basically, it's again reporting our financial information. Um, it has to tie out to the audit. It's organized a little bit differently, but it has to tie out to the audit which I forgot to mention about the OIR reporting, um, that we do have to submit our audit with that annually as well, and they do have to tie out to each other and reconcile. Um, also, the 990 return has the uh, section on it for the test to make sure that we still meet nonprofit status. So there's the section of that that has to be completed to make sure that we um, are still meeting those qualifications. We have ERISA reporting for, 50, for a Form 5500 um, that goes to IRS annually, and that's required reporting that we have to do um, for our health benefit plans and our retirement plans. Um, ERISA covers defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. So they have all kinds of regulations um, that, you know, to make sure that we are complying and running those programs the right way. Um, so we have to fill out this special um, return form for that every year. And then, um, oh, and the next line is wrong. Sales and use tax return is actually done monthly, not quarterly, um, because the scoop does charge sales tax on, right, on like your sundry items and your grocery items. Those are not tax exempt. 
Um, and I want to say, I believe, I think our liquor, our, our liquor license um, also has sales tax. So we have to report and submit that sales tax every month, not every quarter. All right, wrapping up with some of the compliance reporting. Mm, close. Um, general W-2s, right, at the end of the year, and the W-3, which is the summary statement, that's for our payroll, the 1099s to qualified vendors, and the 1096, which is the summary statement for those 1099s, and then 941s, which is the quarterly report associated with our payroll that essentially so shows what our gross payroll has been, what the um, FICA taxes and the uh, federal taxes have been that have been withheld when we submitted them to make sure that we're in compliance with paying those and submitting those. And then we have a tangible personal property return that is done annually, a U.S. Census Bureau report, which is done biannually, which um, in my opinion is just yet another form that the government can say we're collecting data because we're the government we can so we're going to collect data from you. It's essentially collecting financial information, which we reported in so many other formats. It's crazy, but they have that one as well. Um, we have to report to FEMA if we are trying to apply to get FEMA funds or if we have received FEMA funds. Um, it's been almost two years since Ian and Nicole rolled through. We are still working with FEMA and trying to get some reimbursement monies from them. Um, it's looking like we're gonna get some, not all, uh, but it's been a very tedious process to go through that. It's crazy, uh, the documentation that they require in those applications. Um, just to throw in a little side note about it, right? We had a lot of debris all over the roads, right? Especially after Ian, so there was a big process to clean up all that debris. Well, the process designated was all that debris got cleaned up on campus. Our maintenance team did it. We had some contractors come in to help us. And then there was designated roadside places along like monastery, um, maybe graves. I, I don't remember the places, but there were designated places we were to take all that debris and then the city took it over from there, right? The city picked up the debris. They hauled it off to wherever they were gonna haul it off to. It actually cost quite a bit of money <laughs> for us to clean up all that debris. So we're trying to get FEMA to please reimburse us for some of that expense. FEMA wants documentation to the level of, well, what happened after the city picked it up? Where did they take it? What did they do with it? How, what were the size of the truckloads? What was the weight? What all was in the truck? That was out of our control, right? We, we had no control of that. Once we took it to the roadside, it was out of our control, but yet that's the kind of documentation that we've had to follow up with the city to get that information to try to uh, support our request to FEMA. So we're still very involved with FEMA with quarterly and annually, uh, annual reporting. And then we have um, a reporting that we do to um, HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration. This is a result primarily from COVID and the government programs that uh, came about for getting providers some financial assistance. So um, there was, uh, the acronym was PPP <laughs> monies, which we did not get, but then there were other monies that were coming directly from the health resources that were um, being just given to the providers um, for helping to cover expenses and things for taking care of the residents. Um, and then they just want reporting back on what did you do with the money and how did you spend it? So there was a lot of reporting involved with that. Um, they still send me an email quarterly to go into their portal and sign off on, have you gotten any more monies? Have you spent any more monies? And have you used any more monies? John Knox hasn't gotten any monies from that, from those programs since early 2021, and it's three years later, and I still have to tell them quarterly, no, we haven't gotten any more money. <laughs> but that's the government for you. 
All right, so we're out of compliance. Audits, we have a lot of audits that we do. Um, so our financial audit, which is done with our CPA firm, we use Clifton, Larson, Allen the last few handful of years. Um, that is done annually. Um, our retirement plan is required to have an annual audit that is also done by um, the CLA CPA firm. We have to have an audit on our workers' comp policy. That is, um, that is controlled through our workers' comp carrier that they hire a third party, and essentially what they're doing is they're auditing what our payroll was compared to what we paid in premiums because we're required to pay a certain designated premium for every dollar of payroll that we have. So when the policy renews, we're paying premiums during the policy year based on our estimated payroll at the time that the policy renews. And so at the end of the policy year of the workers' comp policy, they will do an audit to say, okay, so now what was your actual payroll come in at times the rates that you have to pay? And it's different rates depending on the positions here on the campus, right? Somebody who works in an office, so my staff, we're less likely to get hurt or have an accident and, you know, unless we're clumsy and we trip over our own feet or we, you know, have an extension cord running across the floor that we're not supposed to, which we don't. <laughs> um, but right, so, so people that are like in offices and administrative are less likely to have accidents, so the rate that the, we are required to pay is much lower for them compared to what are probably the highest rates we have is our clinical people, right? That's, those are the people that um, hurt their backs, they fall, um, things like that. So they have a higher rate associated with them that we have to cover for the premium. So that's a whole process that gets uh, worked on in, on an annual audit. Those cost reports that we do every year, every three years, they get audited. And again, um, CMS takes the lead on that. They hire an external CPA firm um, to do an audit, and essentially they're just then wanting to thoroughly review all the documentation to support what we said were our costs to make sure that it actually was our cost and, and calculate that correctly. And then the OIR is supposed to do their audits or desk reviews that they call it, tri-annually. They got a little behind at some point, um, and the last audit that John Knox did, we finished it last year, and it covered from the years 2013 to 2021. It covered nine years. That's how far behind the OIR got. Now, it makes me a little happy to say I do know that they kind of got their hand slapped over that <laughs> for waiting so long and getting so far behind because it wasn't just our community. They got behind on a lot of communities in Florida. Um, some of the communities that they were also eight and nine years behind on, they passed legislation before they started their audit saying they couldn't go back more than five years. Those communities got off a little easier and they only got a five-year review. We got the full nine-year review. We reported out on that when the audit got done, but just to refresh your memory, of those nine years that we had reviewed, we ended up with one tiny, minor, administrative finding, which was that on one of our annual reports, the dates that we reported for those quarterly resident meetings that we have didn't match the agenda date of those actual meetings. So I will say, those were in years that I didn't work here, <laughs> so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mess up the report. But um, in, in, I want to say it was either the year 2017 or the 20, year 2018, somewhere like it got off and, and, and they were off by like a week and we can't figure out why, but that was our only finding that they had over nine years. So that was pretty awesome. Um, but if they do keep with their triannual, then their next one would cover years 2022, 23, and 24. So next spring, I'm expecting to hear from the OIR that they'll be kicking up another um, audit, desk review.
All right, quick list of some other things that we're doing back there. Um, we have our external audits, but we have internal audits that we've always got going on in there that um, we're always doing reconciliations. Um, you know, I audit uh, the payrolls. Um, well, I review every payroll, and then about once a quarter, I pick a couple of payrolls that I go back and I do a deep dive audit just to make sure everything's really looking good. We're always auditing our financials to make sure that we have things coded correctly. Um, so we're doing a lot of internal audits. Um, our office handles the process for um, everybody's favorite monthly service increase that happens annually. So getting those calculations done and getting the letters issued. Uh, we handle those out of the accounting office. The medical tax deduction calculation letter, I do that in the accounting office. We usually do that around mid-February. We have to wait until the calendar year is closed. I know a lot of people start calling me the second week of January. <laughs> when are we going to have that letter for our taxes? I'm ready to do our taxes. But we have to close our year before I can do the tax letter because it's pulling in all those expenses and everything to be able to calculate that. Uh, the future services obligation report is um, a report that we are uh, required to do every three years. Um, and we just did one, uh, we finished it up this year for the uh, financial year of 2023. And that is a report that essentially tells us looking forward, so future services obligation to take care of all of our residents on campus going forward. Do we have enough in operations money? So they're going to calculate based on what we expect to have being paid to us as monthly service fees over, they, they look out 30 years, 30 years. So in the next 30 years, resident population, here's what you have to take care of. Here's what you're expected to get in revenues for monthly service fees, plus um, funds that you have in savings and investments. Do you have enough money to meet the obligations operationally of providing for your residents? We do, and we have um, a nice little cushion, as it turns out, for that. So that's a report that we have to do um, every three years. Insurance policy renewals, right? All of our, we've got our health policies for our employees, and then we have, um, of course, all of our business lines, property, liability, workers' comp, all those different policies. Um, so I take the lead on that and work on those out of the accounting office. Our sheltered nursing beds extension. So that process we do every five years. And essentially what that is doing is we are requesting to the state to redesignate some of our beds from being sheltered beds, meaning only our residents can be in them, to being allowed to use for community beds meaning we can take outside people into those beds. Um, we're allowed to request for 30 beds to do that, and we've been doing that. I know the letter that we did this year from the historical ones that I found, I know was at least the fourth letter. So 15, 15 years that it had already been done, and then we just did our request for an additional five years. And then the employee appreciation process that happens at the end of the year, that thank you so much residents, we appreciate your generous donations. Um, so the, the committee, the Resident Appreciation Committee, runs that, organizes it, heads it up, collects those donations, makes the deposits, but all the magic calculations happen in the accounting office. So um, I work with that committee to then um, you know, calculate out for the employees that all they have to do is then tell me a dollar amount, and it goes into my magic spreadsheet based on years that they've worked here, how many hours that they've had, uh, that they've worked for the year, and then it determines how much uh, of an appreciation check each employee will get. All right, any questions so far? All right, that's how long you get, no questions. <laughs> All right, so next thing, like I said um, at the beginning, is I just kind of want to reiterate and retouch on, because we can never talk about this too much, is safeguarding yourselves from fraud and identity theft. Um, you know, Joe covers this topic in almost every chat, and how many times has he told you that after the last chat, I had a resident come to me 
and here was their situation. So as long as we know that we've got one or two residents occasionally having these odd situations, some of the times we catch those from the front end that they're like, I think this maybe doesn't sound right, what do you think? And we can prevent the situation from happening. Um, I think we've had a couple of times though that it was an after the fact that we found out about it. Um, so we just kind of like to keep reiterating on these topics whenever we can. So kind of going through some best recommendations and practices. Never give your personal information on an unsolicited phone call, right? Anytime you're answering the phone and it wasn't from something that you initiated and they start asking you for address, birthday, social security number, those are the two big ones. Bank account information, never give that out. Never ever give that out. Even if your, your cell phone caller ID says Regions Bank, those hackers are smart. They know how to make ghost phone numbers look like they're calling from somewhere they're not. So if you did not initiate that phone call, do not give that information out. Get their number. Tell them you'll call them back, that you want to call your, you know, if it's a bank, that you want to call your customer service rep at your bank that you know, and, and you'll discuss it with them. Right? Typical uh, email. It's more an email. You get the email, I'm a prince from... Saudi Arabia, and I'm reaching out for contributions to a great program, et cetera, et cetera. Will you donate? The, don't even open those emails. Throw them in your trash in your email. Um, again, on the callers, right? Ask for their name, their supervisor's name, what phone number they're calling from. You're probably not going to get very far before they hang up on you. So that right there is a clear sign. Um, when you're out and about, any documents that you don't need to have with you, don't carry them with you. How often do you have to show your social security card? Not very often, right? Don't carry it with you. Leave it in a safe place at home. Keep extra copies of your important documents in a safe location, right? Uh, have a copy, a photocopy of your driver's license and your passport that you just keep in a locked drawer at home. That way, if you lose your wallet, your wallet gets stolen, it had both of those items in it, not that I know anybody will really accept that copy of your driver's license and your passport, um, but I can tell you a personal story on that. Years ago, when I worked in, worked for Sunrise Senior Living, and I was regional, so I traveled. One of the areas that I would always travel to was New Orleans. So I was in New Orleans, the first uh, couple of days, we were actually having a regional conference, and then I had six communities that I had oversight of that I was going to do visits to. The second night of our um, regional conference, we were all out at a dinner. Come time to leave, my purse was nowhere to be found. I had it hanging on the back of my chair. My purse disappeared, got stolen. I no longer had a driver's license, um, credit cards, anything like that. Luckily, I was already checked in at the hotel, and it was already paid for. I had a rental car that I was going to be driving around in. I had no driver's license. When I got back to the hotel, I didn't have copies of those things at my home. But oddly enough, because my girls were little, and they were spending the summer at their grandparents, my parents had a photocopy of my driver's license and my credit card in case they needed to seek medical attention for my girls, plus a you know notarized letter. So I called my mom and said, I need you to fax to me to get to an office depot or something and fax to me copies of those documents. That way, if I would have gotten pulled over, I could have explained to the cop what happened and I would have had copies. But most importantly, I had to get on an airplane and fly back home. I had no ID. That photo, that copy of my driver's license, it was a process. I had to go back into their offices. I got to the airport four hours early that day. I had to go back into the offices with the security. They made some phone calls and things. But that copy of my driver's license saved me being able to get on that airplane and fly back home. 
So you never know when you might need something like that. Keep a copy in the lock drawer. I know, one story. Uh, keep your account passwords in a secure location, right? Not just on a sticky note right beside your computer, at least in the locked drawer beside your computer. <laughs> and make them difficult, okay? I use an example. One of my daughter's names is Sarah, and I do often, you know, use personal things that I can remember in my passwords. So instead of using Sarah, that's right there a unique way that you can set it up. Use a dollar sign instead of an S. Use the at symbol instead of an A. Capitalize an odd letter that's not normally one of the capitalized letter. So there's, you know, even if you're wanting to use passwords that, well, I need to be able to remember it, it can't just be, you know, brown chair 156Z2, you know, I want to be able to remember it. There are some unique ways that you can mess with those, you know, kind of change it up a little bit to, to make them a little harder um, than just being a name. All right, and last, um, some recommendations from AARP. And yes, I'm old enough that I am a member of AARP and I get their emails. <laughs> so I actually got this from one of their uh, bullets that came out, mm, I want to say sometime last year. So some of their recommendations in case you have had suspected identity theft, right? First thing you want to do, call your bank, call your credit cards, freeze them. You don't necessarily have to cancel them, but you can freeze them. Uh, get a hold of the credit reporting agencies and also apply, uh, there's, there's an online form that you can fill out to let them know that you've been, um, had identity theft and to freeze your credit report. You know, you don't want somebody going down the street to Bob's used cars because now they've got your uh, credit card and bank account because maybe you had your checkbook, right, in your purse, and they're trying to get a loan and put it through. So you want to have your credit report put on a freeze. File a police report. Set up fraud alerts. You can do those again with your, um, you can do them with your credit card company. You can do them with the credit reporting agencies so that if they do see something coming through, you will get either a phone call or an email, depending on how you've set that up, that somebody is trying to use your information um, that you have said uh, has been stolen from you. If you have any automatic payments set up out of your bank account or with your credit card, you're going to need to change those, right? Because if you froze your credit card and you froze your bank account, while those are frozen, those automatic payments, they'll go or they'll get pulled, but they'll get denied and they'll bounce back. And you wouldn't want to, you know, then cause an issue of, um, you know, a paying off your new car loan or whatever that you are having as an auto pay. Um, or maybe a contribution into an investment account or something. Of course, you would then keep an eye on all your accounts, watch your statements from your bank, your credit cards, and as soon as you can, replace whatever has been stolen. Yeah, it's going to be a pain in the tush. You're going to have to go to the Social Security office, sit there all day long to get a new Social Security card. You're going to have to go to the DMV to get your new driver's license. Um, credit cards are pretty easy to replace, right? You just tell them on the phone. Once they confirm your identity with you verbally, they'll cancel a card, issue you a new card. Um, insurance cards, uh, you know, your Medicare or your AARP or United, you would want to call them and get new cards issued as well. So those are just kind of some best practices on that. All right, that's all I got today, folks. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. And we'll see you later.